it is good for us to be here Praise the Lord And it's good to sing His praises Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Central Oconee Church of Christ for Sunday morning. Thank you for joining us. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 to begin this lesson. Philippians chapter 3, if you want to turn there. Hope you had a great week last week, and you are looking forward to a wonderful Lord's Day today. Great way to start it with a, with a lesson from God's Word. Philippians chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus." Last week, as you remember, I presented a lesson called Never Letting Go. I emphasize that we are all in the hands of God, that He is reaching out for each and every human being who has ever lived and ever will live. This is encapsulated in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 13. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, Fear not, I am the one who helps you. This morning, Uh, We talked about letting go last week. I wanted to talk about holding on, telling the subject from a different point of view. It's not that we just are holding the Father's hand, not just reaching for His. It's also uh, thinking about those things that we should and should not hold on to. I touched on this a little bit at the end of the lesson last week, and I, I wanted to examine it a little bit deeper this morning. Now, the phrase hold on is one that has been used Uh, multiple times in modern music, in music in general. I looked it up uh, on Wikipedia, and I found that there are well over 100 songs with the simple title, Hold On, actually close to 200 songs. There are many other songs that use that phrase uh, as a theme, Hold On, I'm Coming. Remember that Joe Tex song? Great song. Hold On, Hold Out, that's Jackson Brown. Hold On to Me from John Denver, and Ann Murray did a song called You've Got Me to Hold On to. There are many different things that are addressed in those songs, holding on to love, holding on to happiness, holding on to someone, and all of it's pretty positive. So since we are on the subject of being positive, I thought we would start everything off with a positive note and ask the questions, question, what should we hold on to? So we're going to look at first in Revelation chapter 2. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas my faith was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Now, it's best to once again confirm that we are holding on to God. That's a great place to start. We need to trust in his works. We need to trust in his guidance. The Christians in Pergamos held fast to God, even though they were in the Roman center of intellectual thought. It was the seat of idols, just like Athens was. But notice something in that passage. It specifically says, hold fast to my name. Not just hold on to God's hand, but be proud to let others know that we do hold on to God. Matthew 10, Jesus said, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who's in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. It's not just holding on to faith. We need to do that. It's not just holding on to God. We need to do that. But it's also holding fast to our confession, our profession or the showing of that faith. When we hold on to his name, we are letting everyone else know whose we are, and we're letting them know how proud we are to be God's child. And because we can hold on to God, we can also hold on to hope. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Martin Luther King Jr. just uh, once said this, We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. You know, hope is a very strong emotion. We all 
hope from time to time. You might say that hope is sort of the strongest narcotic that you can get a hold of because it can keep us going sometimes. It's used 143 times in scripture by everyone from Naomi back in Ruth to uh, John in his letters. Many times, hope is the only thing that keeps us going. But as with everything else, it has to be hope that is going in the right direction, pointed in the right direction. Think about this for a second. If you say something like, I hope I get revenge, that's not quite the way you want to use that particular emotion. But if you say something like, I hope someday things will work out according to God's will, or I hope tomorrow will be better, that may be a more appropriate way to use that emotion of hope. We need to hold on to hope because hope not only can keep our outlook positive, but it can give us strength so that we can look forward to tomorrow, a time when we can get over what's, whatever is against us this day or this week or this year. <laughs> a lot of people on, the, on uh, Facebook talking about 2020 being such a bad year. Well, yes, but you know what? We have tomorrow to look forward to. And even if we don't have tomorrow to look forward to, we have the hope of heaven to look forward to. Hold on to hope. We also need to hold on to righteousness. Job said this in the 27th chapter of Job, My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. As our brothers and sisters in Pergamos, Job refused to let go of God. And because of his hope in God and his hope in God's plans, he also refused to let go of his righteousness. He did not understand what those plans were, but he wasn't going to let that keep him from doing what God wanted him to do. He refused to allow others, Satan, those three friends that he had, even his wife, to drag him down to a level of distrusting God and turning from doing what is right in God's sight. Now, there are many who just give up in the face of distress. I know you've probably met some people like that. I have a friend who told me of a brother in Christ who lost his job. He was an accountant, and he lost his job. And uh, this particular friend was able to get him an interview after a few months with some another company that he knew of that needed an accountant, and that brother in Christ got the job. Great. He worked there for about two or three months, and at one point he discovered in going through the books that there were some discrepancies. So he went to his boss, the president of the company. He said, well, look, I've, I've found these discrepancies in the books, and I know that someone is taking money from this company. Uh, I've been tracking it. I've, I've traced everything down. And the, the boss asked him, do you know who it is? He said, no, I, I don't, but I'm about to know. I'm pretty close to knowing who it is. So he said, well, thank you for, for bringing it to my attention. And then he left. The next day when the, when the, the brother in Christ came in, he was fired. He was let go from his job because it turned out that the president of the company was the one who was embezzling the money. Now, this man, who was a deacon in the Lord's church, turned away from God. He gave up on God. In the face of all this distress and in the face of what happened to him, he gave up. My friend asked him one time, have you prayed about this? And his answer was, what good will that do me? Just what good will it do me? I tried to do the right thing. I tried to be righteous. And look what happened to me. Well, we need to hold on to it, even in the face of distress. We also need to hold on to righteousness in the face of peer pressure, the call of the secular and the hedonistic world out there. Now, let me tell you something. It's an easy thing to do to give in, but we need to fight against the pull of the world, and we need to maintain our righteousness at all costs. And it's just, just not, it's not just that we remain in good stead with God. It's the right way to live. It makes our world better. And it makes the entire world better to be a righteous person. Another thing that we should hold on to, and this is an easy one, is love. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. We need to hold on to love. It can keep us headed in the right direction. It can keep us headed toward Christ. If we love God, if we love Christ, if we love the Spirit, we are going to want to hold on to those other things as well. 
and it will help us in all of our relationships. Remember the uh, Disney movie, uh, The Jungle Book? I love that movie, my favorite one. There's a scene toward the end where Mowgli is being threatened by a tiger. I think Shere Khan was a tiger's name. And his friend Baloo the bear uh, tries to help him. And what he does is grab hold of the tiger by the tail. Yes, I've got a tiger by the tail, just like Buck Owen said. But he grabbed hold of this tiger and uh, help kept him from grabbing a hold of Mowgli. Mowgli got away. The panther Bagheera was able to take care of him. And after he got him to a safe distance, he called over to Baloo You can let go now. I've got Mowgli. It's okay. Baloo yelled back to him. I can't let go. There are teeth on the other end. Well, that's pretty funny, but you know what? It's true. There were teeth on the other end. But ask yourself this question. Why did Baloo the bear grab hold of that tiger's tail? Because he loved Mowgli and he wanted to help him. He was holding on literally to love. He was holding on to this tiger to keep someone he loved from being damaged. And that's what we need to do is hold on to love because it can make our entire lives so much better. Well, many times we hold on to what we should not hold on to, something that we should let go of. Many times we get a hold of the tiger for the wrong reason. We get a hold of the tiger for selfishness sake or for our own desires. And whether there are teeth on the other end of that tiger or not, we need to let go so that we can grab hold of the things that we should be holding on to. Now, we touched on a few of these last week, and I want to get a little bit more in depth uh, on them. The first thing that we need to stop holding on to is anger. We hold on to anger a lot, don't we? We we hold on to it. We hold it to our breasts sometimes. We just like it so much. And anger is something that will cloud our judgment. It's something that will separate us from the ones that we should be closer to, including God. Anger causes hurt. More often than not, it causes hurt for us instead of the one with whom we're angry. And anger can cause us to do things that we should not. It can cause us to hold on to things that we don't need to be holding on to. Micah seven eighteen tells us that God does not retain his anger forever. Yes, God does get angry. He got angry at the Israelites. He got angry at a lot of people. Jesus was angry at those money changers in the temple. But he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. We should follow Paul's advice. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. That's Romans 14, 19. We should let go of our anger and we should pursue other things. We should delight in mercy just as God does. What a wonderful thing to think about that. You give mercy and you're going to be delighted in it. The other person may scoff at you, whatever, but if you let go of that anger and give mercy, it's going to be for your betterment. We also need to let go of fear. God told Ezekiel this, And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words, or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. Now, this was a group of people he didn't want to be with, but God said, you just go. Don't worry about it. Don't fear. Fear will keep us from being what God wants us to be, from doing all that we could do for the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be anywhere near scorpions. I've never, I've only seen a couple Well, I saw the movie, The Giant Scorpions, but that's a whole other story. I don't think they get that big. But I've never been around scorpions. I don't want to be around scorpions. I don't want to be around snakes. Let me tell you, I don't like to mow my backyard because I'm afraid there are snakes back there. I'm just taking the advice of Moses. You know, he ran from the face of the snake. Now, does that mean that we we should never be afraid? No, that doesn't mean that. Fear is a human emotion, and we all feel fear from time to time, but we don't need to let fear take control of us. We should not hold on to it so that it keeps us from doing something God wants us to do. We should let go of it. We should let go and, and, and just take caution to the wind, if you will, and allow God to guide us and trust in him. Let go of fear. Let go of worry and strife. Do not hold on to worry and strife. 
Remember in Luke chapter 10, that's where Jesus is visiting Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And uh, Mary is sitting there listening to Jesus. Martha is in the kitchen busy with dinner. She gets a little peeved with Mary and she comes into Jesus and says, hey, tell her to help me. Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen, read that, Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Martha's problem was not that she chose cooking. Martha's problem was that she chose stress. She was so concerned over dinner, so concerned that Mary wasn't helping her, so concerned that everything is just right, that she forgot who was there. Worry and stress can cause us to forget about those things, to forget about what's important. And you know what else worry and stress can do? It can cause health problems as well as spiritual problems. We're told to take care of our bodies, but stress and worry, can we can get diabetes from that. We can get heart attacks. We can get strokes. We can get gray hair. I did not get this from worry and stress. I got it because I'm old. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his structure, or to his stature? That's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, you worry about your height, you're not going to add an inch to it. It's just not going to happen. Worry and stress are tools of Satan. They are great tools for Satan because they can keep us focused on ourselves and not on the Lord, not on the work of the church or the needs of others. A few years ago when I was between jobs, another time when I was between jobs, uh, I kept telling everyone down at Central Oconee that I wasn't worried. I was concerned, but I wasn't worried. And Don asked me, well, what's the difference between the two? And what I told him was this. Concern is, well, I want to make sure that things work out okay. I want to be sure that I do have the money to feed my family but I'm not worried about it because God will take care of things for me. This is right after I was offered some help, some assistance. So that was a great thing. I wasn't worried. I was a little concerned, but I wasn't worried. And that's what we need to do is focus on God and what God can do for us. We also need to let go of the world. Matthew chapter 6 and 24 No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, obviously, this is a pretty big one. you got to let go of the world. We want to serve the Lord so much, but the world looks so inviting and fascinating. Remember the story, the uh, Aesop's fable about the dog who had the bone? He was crossing a bridge. He looked down in in the creek, and he saw his reflection. It was another dog that had a bone. He wanted that bone. So he let go of his so he could grab the bone from the other dog, and when he did, he lost his bone. It floated away. Well, sometimes we try to do that with the world. We try to grab a hold of what the world has, and we lose focus on what we have, on the blessings that God has given us. You cannot serve God and mammon. You've got to be loyal to one or the other. There was a lady that I knew who was in desperate straits when she was a, a, a child. She was abused sexually for many years and also mentally for many years. And it affected her life as you can well imagine that it would. As she grew, those in the church tried to help her. They supported her in every way they could. They went out of their way to let her know that she was now loved and that God loved her. But this problem that she had, all of these things, became her scapegoat. She used it as an excuse for everything that went wrong in her life and for anything she did that was wrong. It was her crutch that she leaned on. It was the scapegoat for her own lack of self-control. Remember, scapegoats were the sacrifices. When the sacrifices were made back in Leviticus 16, God said, what you do is you sacrifice these these goats and these lambs and all, but I want you to hold one, and I want you to symbolically put your hand, the priest to put his hand on that. You'll put all the sins of and problems of the um, of the Israelites on that goat, and then you'll take it away as far away from possible from the encampment. That was the scapegoat. Well, this woman, although she was a Christian, refused to give up her scapegoat. It affected her relationships with her brothers and sisters in Christ. It affected her marriage, her family, her relationship with God. It became the mammon that she served. This woman was advised by many different psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, preachers, elders. Whenever it got to the point where they advised her that she needed to put that behind her and move on, 
she gave up on them. Finally, she found one counselor who allowed her to be the victim, agreed to allow the scapegoat to stay in the camp and not go into the wilderness. And it's the same story with a lot of other people in this world. We go through, we've, we've heard all kinds of therapies that are built around finding a way to allow a person to continue to lug around the weight of the world because he or she is a victim. This is what author Roy T. Bennett said in his book, The Light of the World. Accept yourself, love yourself, and keep moving forward. If you want to fly, you have to give up what weighs you down. If you want to be a child of God, you have to learn, like I said last week, to let some things go, to let many things go, and to hold on to other things. Paul said something like that in Ephesians 2, 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Before this time, you listened to what the world said. You listened to those kooky counselors and therapists. Now you need to trust in God for your help and comfort. Now that does not mean that you can't listen to other people, that you can't unburden yourself to other people. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us that we should share our burdens with others. But we have to be discerning and we have to keep ourselves from getting caught in a cycle of fear, worry, and anger. Don't focus on what the world has done to us. Focus on what God can do for us. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's from the Philippians 3 passage I read at the beginning of the lesson. The will of God is that we follow after Christ, that we hold on to love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, just as Paul said in Galatians. And then, just to emphasize what Paul was saying and to emphasize that it is our choice, he says this, against such there is no law. You know, we expect others outside of the church to change so that they can become a part of God's family. But as we, as we are part of the family, we need to continue to change too. We need to continue to grow. One more scripture for this lesson. It's from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, a very well-known scripture. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, we use that contextually in reference to giving of material means, money, time, whatever but it can be applied here. If we let go of what's holding us back and and let go of anger and give mercy, we're going to get mercy. If we let go of hate and we grab hold and hold on to love, we're going to get love. The things that we hold on to can bless our lives if they're the right things. So hold on to God. Hold on to hope. Hold on to righteousness. Hold on to love. Dig in your fingernails. Never let them go. Stop holding on to the tigers of anger, worry, stress, regret, fear, the world. Then stand back and watch what God can do in your life. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for everything you've given us. We thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you for the gift of your Word. We thank you for the gift of your Spirit. We thank you, Father, for your love for us and for all the things that uh, make this life so fulfilling for us. We pray, Father, that at all times we will look to you and at all times we will look at whatever is going on in our lives and understand that we have gifts that we haven't even fathomed yet. Pray, Father, that we'll look for those gifts, that we'll look for the blessings that you're given, you've given us. Pray, Father, that this morning that you will bless all of us as we go through this day and through our lives. Help us all, Father, to hold on to these things that we need to hold on to and to let go of those things that we don't need to be holding on to. Father, we pray especially that if there is someone out there who's been touched by this word, that he or she will want to learn more and that she, that she will get in touch with us and, and let it, he or she will let us know uh, what they want to hear, find out what they need to know. Uh, 
We thank you, Father, for people who are willing to search your word and willing to listen to it. We pray, Father, that you'll watch over us through this day, and we pray that you'll guide us in everything that we do. And we pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Hope you have a great Lord's Day and a great week. Lord willing, I will be with you next Sunday morning. Oh,